be at 9 o'clock, and everyone is welcome for that time of gathering, of feasting, and of fellowship. You also have in your uh, bulletins today, a, I believe, a green insert about Sunday school. I plan to talk to you a little bit about some of the things on that insert. Uh, our Sunday school program is changing once again, which happens with some regularity, uh, like most churches. And we need to think a little bit about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And I'd like to share some thoughts and ideas with you next Sunday morning. So we're looking for everybody to come for a, a great breakfast and also for a chance to hear about our Sunday school program that we've offered for lo forever in this church. Um, there are other things on the, on the program, on our list of opportunities. I just ask that you look them over carefully. There's also a couple sign-up sheets in the narthex. One's about the bazaar, and one is about the cookie shack. And so there are many things happening in our life as we move into September and the fall. Any other announcements out there that I've, uh, that I've missed that you'd like to share this morning? Anybody? There might well be. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. So we are considering gifts this morning, our own special gifts and the gifts that we receive by the Holy Spirit. And this is my understanding of how the presence of God, which we've talked about all summer long, moves into us. So the presence of God is not just out there, active in these good old-fashioned biblical characters, but is active in us as well. So today, let us continue with that journey and that dialogue as we begin singing the almighty power of God. Let us join together in the call to worship. Live by the Spirit. In love, joy, peace. 
in faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Please be seated. I did want to tell you also that our call to worship is taken from Galatians, uh, the fifth chapter, where Paul talks about what are the fruits of the Spirit and then lists those, those particular names. One of, the one of our Sunday school classes many years ago uh, studied the fruits of the Spirit and did a lot of things in, in talking about fruit and trees and seeds and growing things. And, and we planted, or they planted, a, the tree outside my office. It's on this side. And after church, go, go take a look at that tree. It, it was about this tall when they, when they planted it. And uh, the fruit of that particular spirit is now about 20 feet tall. It is truly grown, which also speaks to the fact that I've been here way longer than <laughs> perhaps I should have been. <laughs> oh, no. Everyone go, oh, how sweet you are. <laughs> um, let's have the children. Children, come on up for a time of sharing. Well, this keeps falling apart. Hi there. Good to see you this morning. Have you ever sent a gift to anybody or, or given a present to anybody? Have, have you done that? A birthday gift or a Christmas gift? You've done that? So if you have a gift, and I've, I've got two books here um, from my buddy Kermit Long. And if, if you want to give gifts, do you sometimes wrap them up? because I'd like to send these gifts away to, to somebody. So let's see, I want to put them in the wrapping paper, right? And we'll put them right here. And that's a little long, so we'll fold that over a little bit. Because you want it to look nice when you send it, right? The wrapping paper and all, you, do a, you try to do a nice job and I've got the tape right here. So you've probably done this before, haven't you, all of you? We'll put the tape there and seal that good and tight. And then you fold this end down, like when you make your bed every morning, you do this with the ends of your bed, right? Your sheets, just like that. There, like that, and then we'll do, do you? Good. And now we'll do this, we'll fold this end in and fold it up, because it's nice to have a gift, and then when they get this, they don't have any idea what's inside there, do they? It's like, oh, you open up the gift, and you look at it, and you think, gosh, what is that? That's pretty exciting. And we'll wrap it up in a nice red ribbon, and we'll maybe make a bow. Would you do that? Would you put your finger there for me, Essie? Right there. Or both of you? OK, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Whoops. So you wrap the gift, and you put, have someone's finger. I'm going to put a bow here. And then you might put a card on it. And you say, let's say you say, to, to 
and then you write from, and I'll, I'll write this from Keith, okay? So now, so now we're going to set this to where? I put it down here, so we should be okay. We're going to send this away, and someone's going to get this gift, and hopefully they're going to really like it, right? They'll open it up and they'll say, oh, what a wonderful gift. Thank you so much. And then they might read them and they'll put them on a shelf. And then maybe five years from now, they'll look at those books and they'll say, gosh, what a nice gift that was. I sure enjoyed those books, right? Yeah. So it's wonderful to give gifts and it's wonderful to receive gifts. So what I would like to ask you to do is whenever you pick out a gift for somebody, maybe you wrap it and you make it real nice, think very carefully about how much you enjoy giving that gift. Or if ever you get a gift, say to yourself, gosh, that was so nice of that person to give me a gift. Thank you so much for the gift you've given me. That's all, just a simple little thing of appreciation, the joy of giving and the, and the joy of receiving, the thankfulness of receiving. So that's all, it's just a simple thing in life. But when you have birthdays or get presents or Christmas, it's nice to give and receive. So be grateful for both of those. We'll try a little prayer. Maybe you can repeat after me a little bit, okay? Say, dear God, thank you for gift giving and for gift receiving. Amen. Thank you so much. The Gospel of Luke is full of parables. Of course, all the Gospels have parables, but Luke seems to perhaps have more than anyone else. But this particular parable is found in several of the Gospels. It's a parable of the sower of the seeds. And you have heard this before, I'm sure. Usually when I preach from this Gospel, or teach this, this parable rather, I use the Gospel of Mark because it feels to me more authentic, more, more original, perhaps, if you will. Luke has taken this uh, particular parable and, and moved it a little bit and changed it a little bit because he has another story he wants to tell. He has a message that he'd like to come out because of this parable. So I'd like to share this with you and pay attention especially to just the last line. And We'll talk maybe a moment about that. He has talked about the, uh, um, the seeds, and, and, and actually I, I, I miswrote down what I need to write down. I'm going to have to start a little earlier from the fifth verse. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some seed fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil. When it produced, it produced a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone ears with ears to hear listen. And he said, here is what this parable means. And this is the way Luke understands and interprets this through the eyes and the mouth of Jesus. The seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard. And then the devil comes and takes away the words from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But they have no root. They believe only for a short while, and then in time of testing, they fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, oh, these are the ones who hear. But as they go on their way in life, they are choked out by other cares and riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. But as for the ones in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. Let us pray. 
Lord God, might we be the ones who hear the word and experience the gifts that you give us? Might we be the ones who hold it fast inside of us, always recognizing and knowing that you are the gift giver, never forgetting where it came from and how it has grown to fruition in us. May we then, under the guidance of your love, bear fruit, and may we give fruit May we sprinkle seeds that also bear new fruit. In your love and in your grace, we truly live, O oh God. Now may we each in our own way come to you. May we be thankful for the gifts that we have been given. In your love and in your grace, O oh God, let us live boldly and truly. And now let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now in the silence and the love of your heart, O oh God, we, we pray that we might truly be awakened, aware, and alert. And that we might be those who hear, who listen, who perceive, and understand. Amen.
Last week we took up a special offering for Carson Doublery, who is still in uh, Vanderbilt. And uh, that special offering was about $600. So my goodness, thank you for your beautiful and loving response. And we received a, a letter and a, a picture, which you <laughs> might break your heart when you look at it, of uh, Carson from, uh, from Erica, his mother. Thank you so much for the gifts. We appreciate it. Darling Carson is doing better. He is breathing on his own and very alert. Hopefully a heart will come our way soon. He asked the money will help with my food and such bills. Thank you, Erica, Carson, and family. And uh, we have also received more information this last week that uh, it is such an up and down thing. When she wrote this, he was doing well, and now he's not doing so well. So it's truly a roller coaster ride. So your, your gifts and your prayers have, have meant a lot uh, to Erica and the family. Let us be in prayer with one another. Lord God, it is a privilege to be able to reach out with prayer and with gift to those who have special needs. It is a privilege and an honor to be able to offer love in your name participate in the grace in which we are immersed. And we have prayer concerns that are constant, O oh God. We have prayer concerns for our loved ones and family and friends who might be ill, might be suffering in some way, might be starting new adventures, might be traveling, might be undertaking new understandings of life. We pray that they will be guided and guarded and comforted by you and your host of angels. We have great concerns for this world, for the nations of this world, the inability to live together in any kind of harmony, for power struggles, for tough decisions about what to do, what not to do, what will it mean, what will it not mean, as we consider places of conflict like Syria, knowing full well that there are places of conflict throughout Africa that are oftentimes ignored as well. So we we don't naively pray for peace, but we pray for peace so we might reach for the highest of the goals and objectives that you might see for us as humanity. We pray that we will reach the higher ground with one another and that somehow, some way, we might figure it out and understand that we share this fragile planet, resilient though it might be, we share it as one humanity. So be with us, O oh God, we pray. Help us to come together to figure things out, to find new directions and new ways. Put our pride and egos aside. No matter where we live and what country, no matter who we are, we certainly need your guidance of love and grace. Amen. the 
Paul was in Corinth for some period of time. I would suspect it was one of his favorite, favorite churches that he and others started. But he had to leave and go on his journeys, his other journeys and other trips to other parts of Turkey and Syria and Greece. And while he's gone, they are left to their own devices about what to believe and what not to believe, how to proceed as a people. And so he is getting reports back, maybe letters, maybe personal reports, about how things are going in good old Corinth. And he is disturbed by some of what he hears. And so he writes these letters back to that church to correct some of their errors in judgment, errors in thinking. This particular section of 1 Corinthians has to do with spiritual gifts and an understanding of what is the most important thing we do in church, what is, who has the best gift, if you will, who's the most important person. And so Paul responds to that in this 12th chapter and 13th chapter and even 14th chapter of of Corinthians, apparently there was a big emphasis on speaking in tongues, and that was being held up as being the most important gift of all. So Paul speaks about that. But here's a portion of what he wrote. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit does speak. It speaks through you, unlike these dumb idols, he calls them. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church, first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then following these, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess the gift of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but strive for the charismata, the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Our sermon hymn is based upon 1 Corinthians 13. That still more excellent way is love. Let us join together in that hymn. <clears throat> <clears throat> Though I may speak with greatest power and have Oh, 
Let's pray. Lord, may it be the spirit that truly moves among us this morning. And I pray that the meditations of my heart and the very words of my mouth might be found acceptable in your sight. Amen. <clears throat> when my father retired at the age of 65, uh, Sally and I gave him a gift for his birthday and his retirement. And that gift was a very nice set of watercolors, tubes, some really nice brushes, and a lot of nice watercolor paper. My father was a, a pretty good artist, but he had put aside the paints and materials for much of his life, and he had dabbled in oil paint for a while, but never really in watercolor, but for some reason, we thought it would be nice to give him a watercolor set now that he had all this time on his hand, as you all know, when you retire. And he picked up those watercolors, and he, he took classes, and he loved them, and he used them. And every one of my children now, our children that have graduated from college, have one of the paintings he has painted. And for cards over the years, he would paint cards using not that set of watercolors because they had long gone, but replacement watercolors. But he never forgot. And my mother still will occasionally say, remember, you gave daddy that set of watercolors when he retired. He remembered the gift giver. I suspect, however, that if I were to mail these books to somebody and say, here's, here's a gift from you, I, I think you might enjoy this if you get a chance to read these books, they, they might pick them up and might read them, or maybe, maybe not, but sooner or later they'll end up on the bookshelf. And oh, I don't know, three, four, five years later, they might be cleaning out the house, and they'll look at those books and say, gosh, I wonder who gave those books to me. Well, I, I think I'll give them to the church, church bazaar. And they'll, they'll end up here in the, the bookshelf under the religious section. Is that not true? We don't always remember where the gifts came from that we wear or that we use. And so that's part of the story of 1 Corinthians 12. It's not just that we acknowledge where gifts come from, but that the gift giver becomes part of who we are. Part of who we are. The scripture calls it, it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the common good. So I've struggled and struggled with that word manifestation. It's used only twice in all the New Testament. Paul uses it both times, once here and once in Romans. And every translation out there from the original Greek translates it manifestation. And all these translators truly know what they're talking about, right? Which is why I'm going to retranslate it for you. Manifestation is the feminine noun called, and it's phaneros, phaneros in the Greek. But there's a masculine noun that is from the same word, it's phanero. 
And it's not translated manifestation, it's translated as torch or lamp. And later on, the scripture talks about that the, the light of God, the lamp of God should not be hid under a basket, but should be set out so it will blaze freely. Remember that scripture? You can't hide the light. So I'm thinking to myself, what Paul obviously meant, it's a shame that all those translators missed this, what Paul obviously meant was that the very light of the Holy Spirit should be in you, burning brightly, and therefore through the gifts that you've been given will shine forever. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Of course you do. The light of God is that which burns inside of us, and the gifts we are given are simply the rays of that lamp that never goes out. That's what Paul meant. Otherwise, we might forget where the gifts came from. We might think we should take credit for our gifts. A story. Years ago, I used to play a lot of baseball. In fact, all my friends, we played all the sports in the season. And it didn't have to be organized by anybody. We'd go down to the park, and you'd, you'd get your team together. And at such and such a time, you knew people were going to show up, and they always did. And you'd have anywhere between six and a dozen kids that would show up, and you'd divide up teams, and you'd play baseball. And the diamond was there because you've worn it into the ground over the years. So this one particular day, I remember so well, we were at the diamond, and, and these other kids showed up who we didn't know really well. I mean, we recognized them, but they didn't usually play with us, but we all got together and divided up teams. And there was one guy who was a little bit older than me, I'm thinking one or two years, and he was the star. He was clearly the best baseball player there, and we faced this direction, and out that way was the, the back of the tennis court. So I would pitch quite often or do other things, but I was pitching, and every time you pitched it to him, he would hit it over the backdrop. He would hit it over the fence every time. So you'd try a different kind of pitch. You'd try to fake him out with a real slow pitch, or you'd throw it a little wide or a little bit low, or you'd throw it really fast. Didn't matter what you did. He hit it over the fence each and every time without fail, and I'm not exaggerating. I do occasionally, but I'm not right now. <laughs> Afterwards, after the team I was on that was destroyed by him and his team, it didn't matter if he had any players or not. He could have played that all by himself. He was that good. We said, gosh, you, you, sure, are, you sure are good. You, you, there's nothing you couldn't hit. And I remember the conversation is going something like this. Yeah, he said, my mom and dad are really good athletes, and I, I guess I inherited their, their abilities. I said, oh, really? And he, he went on to say, yeah, that my, he said, yeah, my dad says that I've just been given this natural ability, but, but he works with me, and he throws the ball to me, and we play catch, and he throws the ball, and I practice hitting quite often. So I'll, so I'll get better. He said, I have a goal of becoming a Major League Baseball player someday. I, I don't know if that happened or not. It wouldn't surprise me. I said, OK. So now, years later, I've thought about that conversation. And I thought, he was a guy that wasn't arrogant or boastful about his ability, but he recognized it came from somewhere else, right? Came from somewhere else. He didn't go into the grocery store of abilities and gifts and walk down the shelf and pick this one out and this one out. I want some blue eyes and some blonde hair, and I want a physique of about five foot 11. I want to be really muscular. I want to play all sports really well. Oh, plus this gift of intelligence. I like an IQ of 145. And I want to also be a really nice person. 
You know, you can make your own laundry list of the gifts you would choose if you go to the grocery store of the soul and pick out who you want to be. But he recognized, probably, I guess, through his parents' teaching, that he didn't have that opportunity. He was given what he was given. But he also recognized, through apparently his parents' teaching, that then you work with what you have. Isn't that so? Probably if he didn't practice, if he didn't play, then, then that gift that he had would wither on the vine, would not bear fruit, and would not continue to grow. It would be a seed that, that dies. It had potential, but it was overrun by other things in life. In other words, you've got to have some desire and, and some discipline and some dedication to the gift that you've been given. So my father took art lessons. He had a natural ability, but he, he took lessons to further his gift. And I would suspect that Paul would be in favor of that. Paul was a bright guy. He knew that some people were better speakers than others. And he apparently looked out and he saw some people that had some natural healing ability and some people that did speak in tongues. But these gifts, these charismata, he said, these are gifts from the Holy Spirit to you. Don't ever forget where they come from. Don't ever say that your gift is better than anyone else's. It is gifts of God, and let the light inside of you shine so that those gifts will continue to grow in you and be a radiant beacon to all the world who will see the gifts of the Holy Spirit thriving in your community for the common good, he says. Now, I don't speak about myself too often, I don't think, but, but a moment, if I can indulge you, I, I've got some gifts. In fact, I actually have a lot of gifts. I can draw some, I can sing some, I can write some stories and some poetry. Fairly good athlete most of the time, some of the time, used to be. I probably can do a couple of other things pretty well. I can rise to the occasion and do things that usually need doing. I didn't pick any of those gifts out of anywhere. It's just kind of the way I was born. And then, then over the years, I say, you know, I like doing that. I, I think I'll work at that a little bit more. Or, or I like doing that. I'll, I'll work at that. Or I like, I like being a nice person. I, I think I'll work at that a little bit more. I, I like... I like being patient. I don't like when I'm impatient, so I gotta work at that a little bit more. So the certain things that we're given in life, the gifts that we have, the person that we are, we are in large way given, but then we do have this thing called free will where we can work at that. We can dedicate ourselves to that desire, and that principle, and, and, and lift it up a little bit more. Is that not so? And so each and every one of you sitting here today have gifts. Every one of you. You might have a lot of gifts, some of you. You might have a whole bunch of gifts. You might have some gifts that are really high and some gifts that are not quite so high, but they're still gifts. And my guess is that most of you were given that gift at birth. It was in you. And then you had the opportunity to grow it and to bring it to greater fruition. Sometimes gifts don't seem real big, but every gift is big. Every gift is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul ranked only a few in his mind. Apostles were number one because they knew the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophets were number two, because they were able to look and see the present and the future and talk about it. Teachers, he said, were number three, because they can teach what people need to know. 
but all the other gifts he put on the same level playing field and said, strive for these, but don't ever forget love. And maybe ultimately and finally, that's the gift that we're all given in equal measure, but somehow it doesn't always manifest itself. The light of that love doesn't always shine quite the same. But Paul says, strive more than anything for love in your life. So as you sit here for a moment, I'd like to think about the ways in which you are loving. But I'd also like you to do a quick analysis of your gifts. What is it that you have been given? What is your gift or gifts? And remember that it is the Holy Spirit that has given you that gift and still shines within you. Let us pray. And now, God, in your eyes and in your sight, let us pause for a moment. Let us pause in silence as we experience your love around us and experience how we are loving, and as we think about our own gift. And might we never, for, never forget that gifts are from you and it is your love that lives within us and with, it, with, and with which we are graced. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>